And please stand now for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> and the scripture reading this evening is from Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I want to say before I begin that I, I am deeply appreciative of the session um, having confidence in me to, to proclaim the word, Pastor Mark, and, and uh, giving me this honor and this privilege. I love going out into the streets, but there is nothing greater than coming into the church of Jesus Christ and proclaiming his word. And I, I feel the weight of, of the burden, as Malachi talked about, the burden of the word of the Lord. And I just pray that he would bless the preaching of his word. I uh, am going to take the next, next several weeks and, and preach solely upon Psalm chapter 1. This is a psalm that I've been studying for close to 20 years now. Um, when I was learning Hebrew, my Hebrew is very rusty, so I'm not trying to you know, build myself up. I couldn't quote it in Hebrew anymore, but I, 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 I memorized it in Hebrew and studied it that way, and now I have it memorized in English, and I, at night, in the middle of the night when I wake up from a dream and feel anxious and, and all out of sorts. I don't know if you go through that too. I think we all do. I have that hidden in my mind and in my heart and I begin going through that psalm in my mind and it calms my spirit and I meditate upon that day and night. And so if you ask me how long the sermon has taken me to prepare, I would tell you my whole life. And I'm not saying that with any kind of humor or anything like that. This psalm was not the first psalm that has been written in the Bible, but it was placed by the church of Israel, the nation of Israel, the leaders of Israel, elders of Israel. It was placed in the front of the hymn book of Psalms because of its importance and the power of its meaning. It perfectly encapsulates all the other psalms. It's a very simple psalm of six verses. And I would even argue that the very Bible is contained within Psalm chapter 1. I mean, it starts out, Blessed is the man who doesn't want to be blessed by God Almighty. And even more, <clears throat> well, I should say this. It starts out with the word ashray in Hebrew. Ashray, and that is the word for blessed. And that word ashray is different than the words, if you've ever gone to a, a Seder feast or whatever you hear, Barak, Adonai, right? There's a word for blessedness that is Baruch or Barak, however you want to say it. And the word that is used here is ashray. And ashray conveys bliss or happiness, or divine favor. It's used to describe enduring happiness tied, that is tied to righteousness and the obedience to God's law. It indicates a state of well-being and contentment from living in accordance to the law of God. And it suggests a multiplicity of blessings or a comprehensive state of being blessed, where Baruch commonly used in, is commonly used in prayers and blessings. It's often translated as blessed, and it's used to express blessings upon somebody or something. The verb form means to kneel, indicating the blessing bestowed by a higher authority upon a person. 
It's used in the context like the great priestly blessing in Numbers chapter 6. Um, the, the blessing, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. It was Aaron and the priests blessing the people of Israel. So that's the idea of Baruch, but Ashrei has to do with the blessed state that we are in by choosing the righteousness of God and aligning with God's will. Baruch is more about the act of blessing. So just to summarize, Ashrei focuses on the state of being blessed by God, while Baruch is on the action of the blessing of the superior upon the inferior. Some translations will actually translate Ashrei as happy. But as I say that, happiness that you would use to translate that word is more in line with the word that Thomas Jefferson used in the Declaration of Independence when he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Then, when Jefferson wrote it, happiness was intertwined with virtue. It was intertwined with community well-being and the fulfillment of one's role in society. I would um, tie to that word responsibility. That's how Jefferson was using that word, and I do believe that he had in mind, at least he was influenced by the word ashray, being happy. So that's the idea that we're talking about here. And that's why I entitled the sermon, The Pursuit of Happiness. Who does not want to be happy? We all want to. But that is a stark contrast to the happiness that we have in our day. Our day is, a, you know, snap our fingers and get our way, and I'm happy, and we are like adults that have temper tantrums if things don't go our way. We want our way or the highway. So that's not the word happiness or ashray, blessedness that is in, used in Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man. I think it is the word that Jesus, I think he was thinking of ashray when he was talking um, and preached the Sermon of the Beatitudes. Makareoi is the Greek word for blessed in the Beatitudes. It conveys the same idea, happiness fortune in a biblical sense, or blessedness linked to divine favor. It indicates, Jesus indicated its spiritual well-being or divine joy, not material success so much, because you can be blessed when men revile you and hate you. There's a blessedness that God gives with that. And that's what Jesus used in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through, through 12. It reflects the spiritual wretchedness, moral virtue, and the kingdom of God. And it emphasizes a blessed state from God's perspective beyond earthly conditions. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, Jesus said, when men we shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. That's the idea. Blessed is the man. Psalm 1 is so powerful because it is so stark in its contrast. I don't know if you noticed that, but I want you to really get a sense and understanding of this psalm. The psalm speaks starkly of two different types of people. 
the righteous and the ungodly. And there is no in between. And the words for unrighteous used in the psalm in the English translations, the unrighteous, ungodly, sinners, scornful. And the Bible is very clear that there's only two categories of people in God's eyes. The righteous and the unrighteous. There are, I want to use and help you understand this. There's a list. I listed a, a bunch of biblical uh, terms or contrasts to illustrate this. The contrast that is all throughout the Bible. There is no meshing between the two. Understand that. And this is very important. We have believers versus unbelievers. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. We have the righteous and the wicked, Psalm chapter 1, verse 6. We got the sheep and the goats, Matthew chapter 25, verses 32 through 33. The wheat and the tares, Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Those who are in Adam and those who are in Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. The children of God and the children of the devil, 1 John 3.10, the faithful and the faithless, the wise and the foolish, the saved and the damned, the just and the unjust, the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the evil one, light versus dark, the elect versus reprobate. So you can see that that is no, there is no mixing between these two in God's eyes. And Psalm 1 starts out, blessed is the man in verse 1. And in verse 4, the ungodly are not so. So let's that fix that in our mind, the, 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 the contrast that is there. There are only two categories of people in God's eyes. Those that are righteous and therefore blessed and those that are ungodly and therefore cursed. So we come to a very important question now. How does one become blessed of God? That's, I think, the, the question that's on my mind and I think it's on your mind. Is it the man who walks not in the counsel of the God, ungodly or stands in the way of sinners or doesn't stand in the way of sinners nor sits in the seat of the scornful? Is it the one who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates in his word day and night? Is becoming righteous a matter of not only keeping God's law but doing it right within your own heart? Or in other words, is there something that we can do to procure our salvation and blessedness of God? It's very easy for us all to tick off the boxes, and I've done it myself. In preparation, in fact, I changed the whole direction of the sermon when I realized that I started to, yep, I, del I meditate on his law, I delight in his word, and I, you know, yeah, that's me, you know. And all of a sudden I realized something greater. Do we just tick off the boxes? Yeah, that's me. I don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Yep, yep, I, nope, I don't stand in the way of sinners. And I sure ain't sitting in the seat of the scornful. I meditate on the law of God day and night. And I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with those who do. You know, we start looking at ourselves of all the ways that God would have to accept us as righteous because of us keeping his law. And that's the danger that if you don't really meditate upon God's word that you could walk away with, that I'm going to be blessed of God based upon my righteousness, my holiness, and my obedience of the law. It's very important. And we could fall into that trap. That we believe that we are basically really good people inside. Because of that God sees the intent of our hearts and that we try to be good and therefore we qualify to be that righteous man. You following what I'm saying? It's very important. And the phrase that has come down to us, no, I've skipped a little spot. What I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about now our works and, the, and God's work in our life and how God sees us. And everything I'm going to say is true about every human being, you and I. 
and every person that has walked on the face of the earth except one, and that is Jesus Christ. And the phrase that has come to be known as the, the T in the tulip of Calvinism is total depravity. I'm not going to go off on an exposition on, on tulip, but it is very important to realize that John Calvin, he'd probably, you know, wake up when, he'll wake up when he went to heaven and say, I never came up with the, four po uh, the five points of Calvinism. That was in re response to the error of Arminianism. And it's very important. But uh, be that as it may, what I'm talking about here is the T in the tulip, which is total depravity. It is also called radical or root, the root wickedness of human beings. And now let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. We need to do this. It's very important. And even if you know this and, and you need to hear it again, and I need to hear it again. Back in Genesis chapter 3, in, in Genesis chapter 2, God said that you could eat of the tree, whatever tree that you want in this garden. Just don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because in the day that you eat of the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil, in dying you shall die is the way that the Hebrew says. And so God, basically what God was saying to them was, not that I don't want you to have knowledge. It's not, you know, the Gnostics would say God just didn't want Adam to know anything and Adam, Eve to know anything and he didn't want him to eat of the tree of the knowledge. No, the real issue was that God is the standard of what is holy and it, what is righteous. And he made a beautiful scientific experiment for, for a very poor way of putting it. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is my command. It must be the special revelation that God gave to Adam particularly and to his wife Eve. And you all know what happened. The moment that Adam ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all creation was affected. And Adam and Eve at that point died. And it was the mercy of God that they were not cast physically and spiritually into hell for all eternity. And God would have been good and right and just and loving and holy if he had done that. But the God we worship is a God of mercy. And he had mercy on them. And they went and they hid themselves from God. And so they did not physically die. They started to physically die. But they did not immediately drop dead. But they sure died spiritually. God says in, John, in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. From that moment that Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he and his wife Eve, and all their offspring from that point forward are born spiritually alive. I mean, uh, physically alive and spiritually dead. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, you and I are the wicked in Psalm 1. We are the ungodly. We are the sinners. We are enemies of God with no ability to save ourselves whatsoever. We are under the wrath of God, deserving hell for all eternity. And let me nail this down. There's many sections of the Bible that we can turn to, but I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 18. Own this. We all must own this. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are to all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. One, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace ha have they not. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is true. 
I can tell you this is true of me, apart from Jesus Christ, and this is true of every one of us this evening. So before we start ticking off the boxes and saying, you know, yeah, I'm that man, I'm that righteous man, and I deserve God's blessing because I've done all those things, we have to first start where God has us, and that is in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. They all point to the same conclusion, that we are the wicked. We are the ungodly that is talked about in Psalm 1. And everything that it says about the, the ungodly in chapter 1 is true of us. We are like chaff which the wind driveth away. I'm going to get into that in some other week of what, what that means, what chaff is. It's only the outer husks and the seed, the life has already been taken out and is not good for anything but to be cast out. Left to ourselves, we will not stand in the judgment nor in the congregation of the righteous. And our way will, according to verse 6, perish. And perish means spiritual destruction. It's avad in Hebrew. It signifies ultimate spiritual demise, reflective of hell's separation. It implies eternal damnation and separation from divine presence. Listen what it says in Matthew chapter 3, verses 10 through 12 about chaff. And this is from John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Do you think John the Baptist had Psalm chapter 1 in mind? So I'm going to end with a couple of questions. If we're all so wicked, who is the blessed man in Psalm 1? And the second question is, how can we become a blessed person as well? And I suspect many of you are already anticipating the answer, and good for you, I'm glad that you are. The answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the blessed man of Psalm chapter 1 and Psalm chapter 2 and so forth. Jesus Christ, the second person of the blessed Trinity, was fully God and fully man. The Son of God and the Son of Man. And as a man, he is the only one that has ever perfectly obeyed the law of God. So that when he went to the cross as our perfect representative, the second Adam, he became the perfect substitute that was punished on behalf of sinners. Here, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. A good scripture to commit to memory. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely a righteous man will, die, will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So how can we become the blessed man in Psalm chapter 1? The answer is right there in Psalm chapter 1 verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. There's the answer right, that, right there. I mean, it's concealed, but it's right there. Notice that it is a tree that has been uprooted from where? The desert, where there is no water, and it has been transplanted to a place where the roots can go down into the ground, into the rivers of water. I uh, love to travel to Mexico, and I, I took a, a trip 
by myself for six weeks. I backpacked all throughout the Yucatan Peninsula and it was beautiful. I did a cenote tour. And a cenote, that's the, the Mayan word for well. And the cenotes are these beautiful, incredible places all throughout the Yucatan Peninsula where all of a sudden there's either a cave or a quarry or um, a pool of water, a fresh, clean water in the middle of the places that are so arid and so hot. And I remember when I, I got dropped off, I went to this little town called Hamun, um, Mexico, and it was just stark and, you know, dirt and whatever. And they, I had a guide, I hired a guide, and he took me into these back roads. And as we were traveling along, all the leaves were withered and all the trees were, you know, not looking so hot. Then all of a sudden, I saw this beautiful tree in the midst of all of this. And he said, that's, that's where the cenote is. And so I went, and there was this beautiful tree, and the roots all wove down all this cliff into this beautiful cave of beautiful, fresh, clean water. And while all the rest of the trees were suffering because they, they were, you know, dying and just holding on just by a grasp of a tiny little bit of water, this tree was filled with water. That's how we become the blessed ones of God. It is the supernatural work of God upon our dead and our stony hearts. I love going out street preaching, and I'll tell you why. I love it going out as a Calvinist. Because when I was an Arminian, I went to a Wesleyan Arminian seminary Asbury Theological Seminary, and we were taught that we had to, you know, convince people, you know, they were, they were like Prince's Bride, you know, they, they were mostly dead, you know, they weren't all dead, they were just mostly dead, you know, which means they were partly alive, and so what we were always to do is kind of flame and blow into to flames that spark of God John Wesley talked about prevenient grace that was there you know that's how he got around the whole Arminian thing and and you, that's why the churches get so strange and so weird and they get into dog and pony shows in order to convince people to come to Christ and before you know it they got a whole church full of goats and they're entertaining the goats. And Spurgeon said, what you do to get people to come to church is what you're going to have to do to continue to get them to come to church. And I have such a peace when I go out into the streets because his sheep will hear his voice. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that applies to us here today. The, the difficulty that you have when you pastor a church is this. On one hand, this is the bride of Christ and you preach to the bride of Christ and you proclaim the word of God and you treat the bride as the bride of Christ, but you also never quite assume that everybody in the pews who looks good and sounds good and, and so forth, that they don't need to hear the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you need to repent, I need to repent and turn away from our sins. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I say it out in the streets all the time. You know, the pastors, you don't hear this preaching about the wrath of God upon us because of our stone, uh, stony hearts and the Spirit of God must come in and take away our stony hearts and give us a heart of flesh. That's what God must do. And it's so easy to go out there and just proclaim the love of God in Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit do the work. I mean, there's a question in the, the shorter catechism. What is effectual calling? Effectual calling is the grace of the Holy Spirit whereby the Holy Spirit applies to us the blood of Jesus Christ procured for us. I'm not quoting it exactly. Procured for us in salvation. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And he does that by the means of the preaching of the word of God. How powerful is that. So how do we become the blessed man of Psalm chapter 1? We do that by, I guess I should say, we don't do that. It is the work of the Spirit of God upon our hearts. 
and that is that we become planted by those rivers of water. And I'm going to get into uh, John chapter 15. You know, I am the branches, you are the branches, and I am the, the vine, um, and all those different imageries that God has for us that Jesus Christ is that living water that wells up within us. And the call is for all of us to repent the fact that we are the wicked, that we need the grace of God. And if you are sitting here this evening saying, yes, I know what you're saying is true, you can't even take credit for that because that has been revealed to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all we can do is sit back and say, thank you, God Almighty for having mercy upon me. I don't deserve it, and I don't know why you chose me, but I'm so glad that you did. Blessed is the man. And may we be blessed because of the man, the Son of God and the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Amen.